The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Well, I've been a Christian for about 38 years now, but I have to admit that it's only been fairly recently that I've come to a a sufficient understanding of a very common biblical word, righteousness. Um, You know, I I, I knew that righteousness, as in I don't really have any, but that's okay, because Jesus has plenty to give me. I knew that God was righteous. Uh, I knew that righteous and holiness were kind of the same thing, but that didn't really help that much, because I didn't know what holiness really meant either. And... um, As a child growing up in the 1960s with an older sister who had a lot of uh, psychedelically dressed and chemically induced friends who would walk around doing this. (sighs) That is righteous. (sighs) It kind of, you know, muddied the the definitional implications for me. but, 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 but thankfully, some years ago, I read an author who said, you know, righteousness is about set rightness. Righteousness is when everything is the way that it's supposed to be, when everything is the way that God intended it to be. Unrighteousness, or sin, is when things aren't the way <laughs> that God intends them to be. And righteousness is about putting things back together again so that they are the way that God wants them to be. Righteousness is set rightness. Now, that really helped me because it enabled me to see that that righteousness is both about inward character and about outward justice. When Jesus calls us to be his disciples, he is inviting us to receive his righteousness that we might be fully transformed from the inside out But he's also calling us to join him in his mission of bringing about institutional set rightness in the world. You see, as as believers, we have to care about both the personal and the institutional dimensions of righteousness because Jesus is on a mission to set all things right. For this plenary session this morning, I was asked to address the question, how can we help Christians to to go deeper in their understanding of their callings and their particular type of work? And my suggested answer this morning is that we go deeper when we begin to sort of make this move to a more intentional and strategic focus on this notion of working for institutional set rightness through our vocations. You see, vocational faithfulness has to be about that. Well, this raises the question, how how do we work for vocational faithfulness in in, in, in the sector in which we are inhabiting? Well, I think at least through three ways. One, we seek to cultivate the sector's full creational intent. And, and possibilities. Second, we seek to restore the sector in any place where it's broken or corrupted. And third, we seek to imagine what the sector might look like in the age to come, and then yank a foretaste of that back into our work today, in this age. So cultivating, restoring, and imagining. Well, when I think of the first of those three expressions of vocational faithfulness in an institutional setting, namely cultivating the the full creational intent and purpose of the sector, I think of the work of a young woman who's an architect. Her name is Jill Kurtz. And she takes really seriously the biblical doctrine of creation. Creation tells us, the doctrine of creation tells us that God created a good world. He he deemed it beautiful and righteous, and everything was the way that it was supposed to be. Things were set right. It was marked by harmony, um, in particular by a harmony between the physical environment 
and the people that God had placed into it. And these theological realities really animate the way that Jill thinks about her work as an architect. Let me give you some examples. She deliberately decided to get trained as a green, friendly architect because she wants to design buildings that are good for the environment, sustainable, energy efficient, but also healthy for people. Maybe you've heard of the phenomenon of sick building syndrome. Well, that, that happens when builders use materials that have a lot of toxins uh, embedded in them. And so, for the purpose of human flourishing, Jill has educated herself about that sort of thing and tries to get her clients not to use those sorts of materials. But, but not only that, also to pursue human flourishing as an architect, Jill actually has come to define herself as a public interest architect. Now, you, you've maybe heard of a public interest lawyer. Well, after she graduated uh, from architecture school, she went to San Francisco and worked for some years at a large green design firm. And she came to recognize that many people in our country and around the world who need good design services can't really access them because they're so expensive. And that just didn't sit well with her. So she and a friend started their own green design firm that would offer affordable green design for churches, nonprofits, and small businesses here and around the world. But not only that, Jill went back to her alma mater and got herself a gig as an adjunct professor where she teaches a class <clears throat> which she has designed called Public Interest Architecture. You see, Jill is trying to uh, shape the, the future of the field called architect, architecture by, by shaping future generations of architects, helping them think about outside-the-box ways to deploy their skills. Because, see, she understands that the creational intent and purpose of architecture was that people would build buildings that are good for the environment and good for people, for all people. Well, when I think of the, think of the second um, expression of that vocational faithfulness in an institutional setting, namely the work of restoring the sector to set rightness in the places where it's broken or corrupt, I think about the work of Reverend Luis Cortez. He runs a large nonprofit in Philadelphia called Nueva Esperanza. And just like Jill has taken really seriously the biblical doctrine of creation, Luis has taken seriously the biblical doctrine of redemption or restoration, and he's allowing that to shape how he thinks about his work in his vocational sector. Nueva Esperanza has had for years uh, a front row seat on the systemic discrimination faced by Hispanic homebuyers by the mortgage industry. Hispanic homebuyers with solid, good credit ratings are three times more likely than whites with the same credit ratings to get a much higher interest loan. Hispanic families are twice as likely to have their homes foreclosed as are white families. And many mortgage brokers fail to disclose to Hispanic homebuyers a lot of hidden fees, and they don't make crucial documents available to them in Spanish as well as English. And, and these iniquities and these injustices are, are things that God really hates. And Luis and his colleagues at Nueva Esperanza understand that. And so they're working to, to resist that and to try to do something about it. And they're working for institutional set rightness at both a retail and a wholesale level. Right there in Philadelphia, they've built uh, a number of affordable housing units and they've provided uh, financial housing counseling to about 4,000 families so that they could secure just and, and fair and reasonable uh, mortgages. But Luis understands that to, to really address this problem, he, he's got to uh, play on the national stage. And so he's really worked towards that. He's partnered his organization with the University of Notre Dame to write um, scholarly reports that shine the spotlight on the, his, on the injustices and abuses in the system against Hispanics. And in 2009, uh, Luis led Nueva Esperanza to become a certified national financial housing counseling intermediary 
by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's, it's given them a, a, a national platform to join with other partners and really work for the reform of places where the system just is broken. You see, Luis Cortez understands that the doctrine of Jesus' restoration of all things includes the restoration of institutions, and it includes the restoration of the sector called the housing finance industry. And he's joining Jesus through his vocation to try to set things right. When I think of the third expression of working for vocational faithfulness through the institutional setting, namely, uh, imagining what work might look like in that sector in the, in the future new heavens and earth and then yanking a foretaste of that back into the present, I have to think of the work of Perry Bigelow in Chicago. He's a suburban real estate developer, um, founder of Bigelow Homes, and Perry is someone who has allowed the doctrine of consummation to, to really animate how he thinks about his work. You see, he, he takes uh, care to, to listen to what the scriptures say, like scriptures like Zechariah 8, that talk about children playing out in the streets safely and the old people all hanging around together uh, chatting. And, and he says, you know, that's the kind of neighborhood I need to be building. Um, Perry thinks about what are the values that, would, that will mark life in the new Jerusalem? And, and how can I shape the products that, that I'm developing, houses and neighborhoods, to to incorporate those values. And so he builds houses with really big front porches, and he puts lots of benches and fountains around the neighborhood, because these things facilitate informal neighborly conversation. And that matters because community is a kingdom value. He makes the streets really narrow, and he puts speed bumps in them, because safety is a kingdom value. He puts a lot of green space in the neighborhood, because beauty is a kingdom value. And in contrast to many suburban real estate developers who basically buy tracts of land and then put houses of relatively the same size and relatively the same price, Perry works really hard to provide a wide range of housing stock at many different price points because he thinks that diversity is a kingdom value. You see, Perry Bigelow has allowed his understanding of the consummation, about the way things are going to be one day in the new heaven and the new earth, to affect how he's doing work right now in this earth today. All three of these good folks are pursuing institutional reform through their vocations, and that's really important and it really matters. It matters because we are not going to achieve cultural reform in the absence of a real a deliberate focus on institutional transformation. Just sort of capturing people's hearts and minds is, is not enough. We need to care about institutions and institutional reform. And God has always been interested in the common wheel. He's always been interested in, 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 in institutional reform and set rightness in the public sphere. I mean, from the very beginning of his dealings with the Israelites, God wanted to create a people who would be doers of righteousness. People whose faith would, would, would shape and animate them, not only inwardly and privately, as important as that is, but also outwardly and publicly. And the church historically has taken up this mantle. I mean, think about the, the role of the church as a creator of institutions. The medieval church is, is considered really the, the founder of the modern university in the modern hospital. Think about how the church historically has involved, been involved in the, in the transformation of institutions. Think about the role of the 19th century church and how it brought about the abolition of the British slave trade and how it helped to end child labor here in the United States. You know, unfortunately today, we have many believers who are kind of allergic to the word institution. And we have believers who are very skeptical, very wary about this conversation of, you know, pursuing the common good or having the church influence the culture. You know, they've been burned, understandably, by the overly politicized activities of both the religious right and the religious left. And so some of these folks are saying, you know, what we need to do is withdraw. <laughs> we, need to, we need to pull away. We need to, we need to hunker down. We need a fortress. 
But my friends, we must not allow our faith to become privatized. We must be doers of righteousness as God calls us. And a major way that we express that is through our work. And I believe that as we work for institutional set rightness in our various sectors, we will experience a deeper sense of satisfaction and joy and meaning in our work. And what's going to happen is the scattered church will be out there bringing about transformation in these various social sectors through the faithfulness of their work. And in our society, we will begin to see many things set right that desperately need to be set right. Thank you.